Welcome. Um, I am glad you all are here again tonight for our second in the series of Caregiving, Navigating the Journey. Um, we'll go ahead and get started and just um, are grateful that you are here and we had a great session last week and look forward to two more sessions following this one. But tonight we're very grateful for um, Jennifer Sakai who is here from Caring Corner brings years of experience, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute, and then Blake Brookshire, who um, is actually one of Mars Park own and also a member of our health ministries team and the physical therapist, and the two of them are going to tag team tonight and talk about aging in place. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to just have a brief devotional for just a moment. Um, we took, my husband and I took care of my father-in-law for a number of years, and my father-in-law had railroad tracks probably a quarter of a mile back behind his house. And as our children were growing up, we would take them back there to walk on the railroad tracks. And it became a favorite of mine to walk back there and walk on the railroad tracks. And one time I was walking back there and I thought, you know, railroad tracks are a little bit like life. And I think they're a lot like caregiving. Um, you kind of walk on those tracks and if you look up and you look too far down the track, you're going to kind of lose your balance and your perspective and you're going to fall off those tracks. Um, if you look behind you to see, and I would do that to see if my kids were behind me, you also kind of lose your balance and you fall off the tracks. Um, if you look right down at your feet, you kind of lose that perspective and you don't have a very good perspective um, and you kind of get lost in your feet and you can get messed up on the railroad tracks that way. But if you put your gaze just slightly out in front of you on that ba and then that balance, you can keep your balance pretty well, and you can stay on those tracks I found for quite a while. Um, and I think caregiving is a little bit like that. You look too far out and you see 10 million possibilities of what can occur, not that you don't make plans, but just it, when you're in the midst of that stress to plan and look ahead and put that gaze ahead but not look too far so you get yourself overwhelmed. Um, looking behind you can feel a little overwhelming. And, and part of caregiving is keeping that balance. Um, we had a caregiver group for a number of years, and those that attended, it was kind of how can I keep my balance of taking care of myself, taking care of my loved one, maintaining my own life. And it is a little bit of a balancing act. Um, so I share that with you for whatever that may be worth. And I do think that in the midst of that balance is God and our faith and, and how we can be strengthened and look to our faith to empower us, to calm us, to give us some peace and to give us some strength in the midst of that. Um, let us bow for just a moment for a brief prayer. When I don't know what to do, O oh Lord, let me do what love requires. If I cannot make a choice, let me do the next small thing. Step by step, show me the way from one small act to the next. For in those small acts of love, your spirit's, love, your spirit's light will guide me. Amen. I um, want to introduce our speakers. I'm a little short. There we go. Um, Jennifer Sakai is, has a Master's of Arts in Gerontology and has worked in the industry for... 15 years. About 10 years ago, she opened Caregiving Corner, um, and this is a care management and counseling firm that works with families and caregivers and older adults to in our, in our community to work out caregiving issues and to see where is the best place to go and how that care might occur, especially in home situations. Um, she is a nationally certified care manager, and she speaks regularly in our community and around town. Um, and Blake is a physical therapist, and she works in gerontology and neurology. Um, Blake has found an interest in and has a passion for educating patients um, in their general population, and especially around home modifications. Um, in 2013, she earned an executive certificate in home modification from the University of Southern California. So they both bring years of experience, and we are very grateful they're here to share with, um, with us tonight. Just to mention to you, um, I only have one copy of this. It's not something we can give away as in other handouts, but a guide that I have found helpful is How to Care for Aging Parents. Um, it's kind of like a little encyclopedia 
in itself. It has financial and an array of wonderful information. So I mentioned that as, as a resource that I have found helpful here. Jennifer, turn it over to you. Is that better? Everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Blake Brookshire. I'm a physical therapist. I'm so honored to be here tonight. Um, Myers Park has been my home since we, our home church since we moved here in 2007, and I'm happy to be able to do this. Um, I will be addressing kind of the physical environment portion of, of this talk tonight. Um, and so I'll get started, and then Jennifer will follow up on some more um, logistics. So um, let's get started. We'll start with a show of hands. Uh, who in here plans to stay in their current home for the rest of their lives? If you, if you could plan it anyway. Okay, good. And then who in here is caring for someone or will have to care for someone, and they plan on staying... <laughs> <laughs> where they are for the rest of their lives. Interesting. There's a little more of that. Okay. Um, AA, a couple statistics. AARP um, is, has found that 83% of older Americans uh, want to stay in their current home for the rest of their lives, <clears throat> which is kind of what we just saw here. However, most homes are what are often referred to as Peter Pan housing. It's kind of housing for people who never grow old. Um, and, and for those who it would not meet the needs of people over 65. Um, the CDC has done some research, and they kind of speculate that home modifications and repairs um, may prevent 30 to 50 percent of um, home accidents and falls. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big deal, and so it's worth considering, especially if someone is, um, you know, determined to stay, to stay in their home. So we'll talk about kind of whens and wheres. When should, your, when should the home be adapted? Um, if you're planning on remodeling your home or doing some fix-ups of your home, if you're going to have a contractor in there anyway, it might be time to start thinking about what changes would be helpful to, to facilitate me staying or our loved ones staying in the home. When they're in there, it's less expensive to have them come out once and do some things than, you know, multiple times. So just think about that. Um, when there are changes in mobility or abilities, for example, um, with a health change, with a surgery, that you, if you're planning for a surgery in the future, that might be the time to do it. Or if your plan is to age in place, you want to stay where you are, then you might want to go ahead and start thinking about <clears throat> adapting your home, and we'll talk more about what those adaptations should be. And so the alternative, maybe you might want to think about selling your home that you've been in, downsizing, and finding um, like a patio home or a community for seniors built with, you know, homes that are already accessible that have no stairs, wide doorways, um, that sort of thing. So we'll get more into kind of the how, readying your loved one in the home. You want to, for every, modifying the home is not, um, you know, kind of a one size fits all. You need to, you want to have a general idea of what the individual who is going to stay there needs. And so it might not be a bad idea to have an assessment by various health professionals. I'll go ahead and toot therapy's horn. Um, a physical therapist can give you a lot of information about how someone exists in their environment, how they walk, their balance, um, their fall risk, their muscle strength, their ability to go up and down stairs. So that might be some good information to have before you start going down that road. Occupational therapists, uh, their specialty is self-care, um, hobbies, what makes a person happy, what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, Again, excellent information to have. Speech therapists, not only just focus on speech, but also swallowing, and also are uh, experts with cognition and memory. So if that potentially may be an issue, there are ways to modify the environment for those who have cognition or memory um, issues. 
they would be the, the go-to for that. Obviously, a physician for if um, the loved one may have a diagnosis that may have long-term implications, um, like a degenerative type disease, um, you would want to have your physician or a specialist on board that can help you kind of know what the prognosis is. Is it something that, um, you know, at some point they m might be non-ambulatory, so you may need to consider that when you're modifying your environment. And I'll toot Jennifer's horn as well, because the geriatric case manager can kind of help you pull all this together and synthesize all the information, um, and as well do their own type of assessment with your loved one and help pull all the information together. So that's one piece. It's the individual. The other piece, of course, is the home. Is the home in good repair? Is it structurally sound? Um, are there stairs damaged? Does the roof need to be repaired? You want, just in general, obviously, you want to make sure the home is in good repair. And then it's probably a good idea to do some sort of formalized home safety evaluation. We've given you a couple of resources here. One is the sheet that has the rebuilding together at the top. I apologize for how small it is. I didn't realize it would quite print out like that. But you can find this online if you need, a, need to see it bigger. The front is a kind of a checklist, a very thorough checklist to go through your home and help, kind of help evaluate the environment as it is. And then the reverse is gives you possible solutions to make your home more accessible, uh, more safe. So that's one uh, resource. And then I'll point out another resource um, in this Simple Solutions magazine um, that Jennifer brought. In the very back, there's also um, a checklist, a great home safety, safety checklist that goes room by room that might be something to consider as well. And then, of course, um, you, might, you probably want to consider a trained professional, whether it is a physical therapist or an occupational therapist that has more um, background um, most any OT or PT should be able to do a very basic home safety evaluation for you. But if you want something a little more in-depth, if you're considering putting money, spending money uh, on your home or on your loved one's home to make it more accessible, I would, um, and we'll talk more about this, um, do consider having someone who has had a little more experience in that come and, and take a look because um, it is an investment and you want to maximize the efficiency of that. So then kind of plan and design, um, we've got kind of a spectrum here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you all know, but we have a great resource in the basement of, uh, of this building, the uh, durable medical equipment closet. There's tons of stuff in there if you ever or your loved ones ever need it. Um, Susan can help you um, utilize that. But that's kind of one end to put in, you know, a a shower chair or a tub bench or that some sort of thing. So you want to utilize whatever equipment you can and it's always best again to have a healthcare professional kind of walk you through that sort of equipment that you may come home from the hospital with or a therapist may order for you. Um, and then that's one end. Of course the other end is when you're ready to make changes to your home like a, a walk-in shower or widen doorways or build a ramp. Um, just as you would uh, get bids on, you know, if you were going to replace your roof or redo your room, consider, you know, researching it. Find specialized professionals who have experience in this. Get a second opinion. Get several bids. You just, as I said before, you want to maximize your efficiency of this money that you're putting into your home. And uh, it's a good idea just to get... Um, some input, like I said, from a geriatric professional or a healthcare professional that has experience in that realm. I would love to go through each room and kind of point out several things, but we would be here all night because I could talk all day and all night about it. But we'll just, I'm just going to pick a couple rooms that tend to be kind of problem areas and we'll, I'll give you a few specific recommendations on that. Um, probably the bathroom, well, I won't say probably, the bathroom is where the large majority of slips, trips, and falls happen in the home. 
And so we'll talk about a couple different areas of the bathroom. Having poor support around the toilet is one big problem area. Ways to fix that, a toilet frame or grab bars around the toilet, having a raised height commode. As I said earlier, if you're doing any remodeling to your house now, you may want to consider getting the, it's called a comfort height commode. You can find it at Lowe's. They easily find it there. It might just be something you want to go ahead and put in, and then it's there when you need it in the future. I know grab bars tend to be pretty ugly, but if you go online and search grab bars, you can find some very attractive grab bars. If I was at Lowe's today, they have some really beautiful grab bars that look like, like you would install for your towel bars, but they are made to take your weight. So it's, again, it's something to consider going ahead and putting in, and they're not as ugly as, they, as you may think. Another difficulty is stepping in the tub, so typical classic tub showers are often a problem um, because of the slip and having to step over. Um, one very simple Walmart solution is uh, shower shoes, not flip-flops because they'll come off, but the little aqua shoes you can find at any, um, you know, Walmart or Target. Um, and then also putting the non-slip strips on the bottom of the, to of the tub. Um, of course, grab bars, as we said again, tub benches, um, handheld shower heads. You can find tub benches, you can find shower chairs at Lowe's. They're very easy, and you can also find them online. Um, again, even with that, it's probably a good idea to have someone who has experience with that to just make sure it's installed right, make sure it's stable, and is in good, safe working order. And then, of course, again, the other, the other end of the spectrum is to remodel to a level entry shower. And I apologize for the graininess of the picture as you blow it up. Uh, but this is a great example of how you can have a nice shower. It looks, um, it looks lovely. It doesn't look too hospitally, I don't think. But you see they have the grab bar. They have a seat. They have a handheld shower where it's accessible from where you sit. This is a very good example, though, that you want someone who has experience in putting in a level entry shower because, as you can imagine, if it's not done well, you can wind up with a lot of wood rot. You can wind up with water all over your bathroom. So it's just one of those uh, instances where it's very important to you know, have a trained professional that has knowledge of putting this in. You just don't want a you know, handyman off the street. And then in the bedroom, poor lighting. I've uh, been in a lot of homes for home health, and you go in the bedroom and you can hardly see. And, and it's important to have good lighting at night to ensure good sleep, but during the day or when you get up to use the restroom that you have good lighting there. So having a touch lamp at night to make it easy for your loved one to turn the light on and get to the bathroom. Or having a night light. Um, nighttime bathroom trips are quite frequent in an older population, so thinking of ways to minimize those trips to the bathroom, which would minimize the risk of falls, possibly having a urinal or commode chair next to the bed, or even just as simple as wearing non-slip socks to bed, kind of the hospital socks, um, so you don't have to worry about slipping on bare feet at night. And uh, this was a kind of a personal um, example, difficulty getting in and out of bed. My husband's granddad had some vertebral fractures and was having difficulty getting in and out of bed. So we um, found this bed rail online at Walmart, very inexpensive, but it fits between the mattress and goes around the box spring. It's unobtrusive, so it's, it doesn't prevent him from getting out of bed, but gives him a little extra support to hold on to um, to get in and out when he was having the back pain. Again, he didn't need a hospital bed. We didn't need to go to that end of the spectrum, but just a little bit of support to help him stay safe um, uh, and maintain his mobility as he was healing. Wanted to touch a little bit on technologies. There's a multitude of companies and products out there that utilize technology, and I think we're only tapping the surface as, as we go. Um, 
One that's largely popular, of course, is the Personal Emergency Response System, or the PERS. And this is kind of like the I've fallen and I can't get up that we all know, but it's come a long way since then. Um, it's something that can be tapped into via your security system. Um, there are lots of local companies, national companies. I think Jennifer is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, medication dispensers. If your loved one, their only thing is that they can't get their medications quite right. Their, their cognitive level is such that they're, you know, off a little bit. There are medication dispensers about the size of a coffee uh, maker that you can fill, and it'll pop it out exactly when they need to take it. So there, you know, there are lots of fun toys out there to help facilitate them maintaining independence. Audiovisual monitoring um, and telehealth. Um, quite frequently, if you're if you get um, come out of the hospital or from a nursing facility and you go into home health, and your doctor orders it, um, the home health companies can bring to you a monitor which can monitor your vital signs at certain times of the day, and all that information is compiled and sent directly to your doctor's office. Um, anything from blood pressure to heart rate to oxygen level to glucose uh, to your weight, all of that can be monitored uh, in the home and sent to your doctor so adjustments can be made to your medication as needed and hopefully keep you out of the hospital. So lots of great stuff. Um, just a little bit on products. Um, durable medical equipment includes things like walkers, canes, um, bedside commodes, shower chairs. Um, a few of these are paid for by insurance. Um, many are not, but it's certainly something to consider for your loved one, even if it's not covered by insurance, to maintain that independence and prevent falls or accidents. And then, kind of on a greater level, accessibility solutions uh, for your home. If your loved one is in a two-story house, they've always lived in a two-story house, their master's on the second, they're not leaving, this is where I'm going to be, but they can't get up the stairs. You have uh, the options, of course, of stair lifts that um, can be put in um, without too much damage to your home, and um, there's some good companies here in Charlotte that can take care of that. Ramps, of course, to get in from the outside, um, and also ceiling or bathtub lifts. Um, they can be installed in the ceiling, or they're frames that can be constructed in the home that have lifts that can actually help you transfer your loved one in and out of bed, in and out of the bathtub. Again, it's all, it all kind of depends on what they need and what their home can accommodate. Six points, big points that I, if you don't remember anything else, if you'll take these home. Um, not everyone's home will need the same modifications. Not everyone's the same. Um, not every home is the same. So it is, it is a very individualized process and our recommendation is just that make sure you get good folks working for you and that you have um, trained professionals in the field consult on that. You want to think about the outdoors as well. They have to get in the house. So where do they park the car? What's the surface like between the car and the home? Of course, the stairs, the railings. Um, what's the easiest way to get in the home? Maybe the most typical, the way that they've always come in has not been the most easiest, safest way. You might want to think about another way. Another personal example, even if, the, even if your loved one has 24-hour care, they're fortunate enough to be able to have someone in the home 24 hours a day, you still want to consider home modifications, um, for, which is necessary for the safety of the caregivers. My husband's grandmother on the other side um, had a Parkinson-like um, disorder, and she was fortunate to be able to stay in her home, but at, towards the end of her life, it was very hard for her caregivers to transfer her. And so we were considering lifts and that sort of thing because we loved the caregivers, and they loved her, and we didn't want anything to happen to them, and it was a good situation. So consider, even though, you know, maybe... Maybe you've got somebody there to take care of everything. The caregivers need to be taken care of you as well, paid or not paid. So home modifications definitely go into that as well. Resistance to change is likely. Um, some people aren't 
who've been in their home for a long time. This is a big, this is a big thing, I know. I wish I could talk more on it. Um, but one, a lot of the modifications we talked about can be changed back. You can always take grab bars down and, and redo drywall. I like to think about it kind of like baby proofing. Um, when a baby comes into your house, you want to make the environment safe. You want to make the environment not frustrating for the parents or the child. Same way for someone at the other end of the life spectrum. You want to make it safe and, um, and comfortable for them as well. You want to consider the cost benefit of what is needed. Um, an example would be if you have a, an old Victorian home that's, um, you know, very difficult to remodel, very small doorways. There would have to, there would be a lot involved. That would certainly you want to consider the cost of it versus what's the benefit you're going to get. And. I'll say it one more time. Carefully evaluate any work to be, done, to be done. You want to utilize experienced professionals, get input from geriatric providers, so that if you do put money into this, that it is done well, it's done efficiently, and it will last for them throughout the, the loved one's lifespan. These are some great resources, um, which are also, most of them are printed in the back of these um, these. Um, publications that Jennifer handed out, and I will pass it over to her. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Thank you. We're going to um, take questions at the end, so as soon as I'm finished, we'll open it up to whoever has questions um, for either Blake or myself. I want to talk just a minute about care management. Um, Blake alluded to some of what it is that we do, but uh, I think that this chart that our national association uses really illustrates what a care manager's role is. Um, we are kind of the quarterbacks of a caregiving situation um, in that we are responsible for bringing in all of the professionals, the services, and the resources that are going to be needed to get someone from where they are now to where they want to be with caregiving. Um, so in that sense, we kind of act as the one-stop shop resource um, for people that are on this journey. And we do take a very holistic approach. I think sometimes that is a, is a term that's overused, unfortunately, but I do think uh, that, that it's the best way to describe what it is that we do. We take into account all of these different, um, all of these different areas of, of a person's life. And uh, Blake touched on a few going in and doing you know, a, fun a functional assessment. Uh, looking at the financial considerations, the family support, uh, what are the medical conditions that a person is dealing with, all of that is very, very important. I don't purport to know all of that, but I know how to get to people who can help us figure that out. Um, so I've got a good example. We had a client who was living at home. A physical therapist um, had come into the situation and we were having some difficulty understanding why the client wasn't electing to get up from her living room and go prepare something in the kitchen for herself after her caregiver left. And this was probably, she was skipping entire meals. She would just wait until breakfast the next morning because she was too tired. And the physical therapist called me and he said, well, Jennifer, he said, I figured out that she's at about her, like 90% of her max heart rate when she gets up from the sofa and goes into the kitchen. And I said, that sounds pretty high. Can you give me something so that I can understand that a little bit better and take that back to the family? And he said, do you run? And I said, typically only when being chased, but I have run on occasion, so I, I get where you're going with this. And he said, well, if you can imagine running at your top speed for 10 minutes straight, he said, that's, what, that's the kind of energy she's expending getting from the living room to her kitchen, which is about the distance of you know, 25, 30 feet. And so in that moment, we understood some of the challenges that we had for that client in a way that the client couldn't possibly have explained to us. Um, so it's very, very important to get a team of people in place that have the, the knowledge, the skill sets to be able to figure out what all of these different pieces of the puzzle are. If someone uh, doesn't have legal documents in place, we need to find somebody that can help us do that. Um, if I need to understand better the financial situation, we need to team together with a financial professional and the client to figure out where we can go. 
Um, when we're looking at home situations, it's particularly important to concentrate on three areas, and that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. And if you've got my handout, um, it's the top three. If you don't have a handout, if you want to raise your hand, I can have somebody. I think everybody's got one. Okay, good. Um, so the, the, kind of this, it, it worked out that there are the three Fs. I guess I could trademark that. It didn't, it, that wasn't intentional. Um, but the first one is functional ability, and this kind of uh, matches nicely with what Blake just explained. Um, really looking and examining closely what the person can do and what they can't do. Um, and I always tell people identifying what a client can do is sometimes just as important, if not more important, than identifying things that they can't do. Um, because oftentimes you can put in better solutions, better equipment, better technologies to kind of capitalize and maximize their, uh, their ability rather than focusing on the disability. So again, this is done through a process of assessments. We're looking at uh, the person's taking into consideration, again, the prognosis, what, is the, what are their health conditions that we have to look at. Um, very often, if a therapist um, has been involved, we're getting feedback from that therapist about what we can expect this person to be able to do. Um, but we want to look very closely at that. Um, when, if, if we're assuming that we're working with a situation where someone can be uh, kept at home, where it is, it's feasible for them to live at home, uh, we want to make sure we've got not just a plan that's going to work today, but as Blake alluded to, something that's going to work long term. And so planning is very, very important. Um, it's not really a good idea to kind of fly by the seat of your pants if the plan is to stay at home. It does require a good bit of forethought. Uh, we also want to look at family and community support. Um, many of our clients are blessed to have very, very supportive families. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is. Um, and so th either through estrangement, uh, some people not having family close by, there are some individuals who do not have any family support. This is something as care managers that we really have to take into consideration. If you have someone who is going to be at home um, and is going to need assistance, we are going to either need to be able to hire that assistance and bring that into the home, or we are going to need to depend on informal caregivers, those individuals who are not paid to be able to provide that support. So having an understanding of the family dynamics um, is key. One of the things that we focus at, um, at focus on at, at our company is looking at the caregiver as well as the older adult, um, because it kind of goes back to that that adage on the airplane: you're told to put your oxygen mask on first, and then the person next to you. If the caregiver is not taking care of themselves, they're not going to be any good for us when it comes time for them to help out with the person who really needs the care. Um, so we've got to make sure that if family support is in place, that those caregivers don't feel like they're being stretched too thin. The other piece of it is looking at financial considerations. Um, and again, this goes back to whether or not this is something that's realistic um, to begin with. Is it possible to pay for the home modifications that are needed? Um, is the individual going to be able to pay for the support that they may need to put into place? Um, are they going to have the resources that are going to be able to grow with them as their needs increase? Um, because what we see today that a person needs may not be all that they need between now and the end of their life. And of course, that's not something possible for us to project either. So we don't know if we're planning for someone for six days, six weeks, six months, or six years, um, which can make that piece of it very, very tricky. I want to spend some time talking about some of the pay sources uh, for care, some of the things that Blake talked about. Um, it, it's important to understand that there is not any one particular pay source that pays for all of this. So she mentioned that some equipment is covered by insurance, some is covered by Medicare, some long-term care insurance can be used. So it's real important when you're looking at that financial piece to take into consideration what is available to the person. So when we're going into a situation, we're simply not interested in what cash they have at their disposal or what their income is, but we've got to look at do they have a long-term care insurance policy? Might they uh, be qualified to receive veterans benefits at some point? Do they have a supplemental policy that's going to pick up anything? Uh, we need to know all of those different pieces so that we know how we can maximize um, those benefits as we're putting in um, solutions in the home. The first one I have listed is Medicare. When we're looking at the home environment, the two services we most often refer to, and we really I don't think I've ever had a client that has lived at home successfully to the end of their life without using at least one, if not both of these. Um, but home care, non-medical home care, uh, which are AIDS, 
um, certified nursing assistants coming into the home to provide either companion, meal preparation, that level of service, or hands-on care. And then home health care, which is covered by Medicare. Very different, and unfortunately, long-term care insurance policies use uh, the reverse language to describe them, so it gets kind of hairy how you split that up. But non-medical, uh, you're gonna be paying for privately, and then home health, is where you can have uh, therapists come in, p uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, as well as a nurse come in, but it's intended to be short term. Um, but I would say those two categories of care are where we really try to, um, to, to maximize the person's ability to either pay or use that Medicare benefit to really support them uh, within the home. Um, so that, that is key. And Marie Warren, who's, I'm going to pick on her, she's in the audience. Uh, if, you, if you want to know anything, everything I know about home health, I know because of Marie Warren. So uh, if she doesn't know the answer, it's probably a bad question. <laughs> um, but Medicare pays for short term, a short term stint for these therapists or nurses to come in. You most often see home health being used in a setting when someone is transitioning out of the hospital or transitioning out of a rehab center and coming back in. This is where using a therapist is particularly key. I was at a client's home um, and the therapist from the nursing facility that she was coming home from were at the home and they were looking and, and as Blake described, kind of room by room, particularly paying attention to those problem areas to try to let the family know what needed to be in place before they could recommend that she be discharged home. Um, and so the brother had a list of things that he was going to need to do or change or upfit or purchase um, in order for his sister to be able to return to her home safely. Um, so that part is, is key in bridging the gap. In terms of paying for long-term care, Medicare does not pay uh, for long-term care for someone to come into the home indefinitely um, to provide hands-on care. Long-term care insurance is uh, probably right now we have clients at an all-time high in terms of the number of people we are servicing right now who have long-term care insurance policies in place. These are wonderful. I just met with a family today and they said, we want you to look at our policy and, and explain to us what it covers and how we can best use it and can we go ahead and start using it. So going through those policies and trying to figure out what, what it's going to cover. Um, their policy happened to cover home modifications. It covered equipment. It covered some of the technology um, that Blake mentioned. Um, again, there is, there, th this is a very hot area in aging right now, developing new technologies to keep people independent at home for as long as possible. So the medication dispensers, the um, emergency response pendants, they now have systems that will automatically detect if someone has fallen because we know that not everyone can remember to push the button and not everyone may be conscious and able to push the button if they fall. Um, so these technologies, are, there's something new almost every single month that's coming onto the market. And these policies will pay for those. And one of the reasons why these policies will pay for those technologies is it's much cheaper for the long-term care insurance company to pay $45 a month for you to be monitored with an emergency response pendant than it is for them to pay $6,000 for you to go live in a nursing home. Um, and so they're, they're smart, they've done their homework and they know that they'd rather pay for that technology be, to be implemented. Uh, Long-term care insurance is going to cover home care. Um, in most cases, so again, we want to look at the policy. What does it say? What, what qualifications do we have to meet in order to get this client um, qualified to be using uh, that part of their benefit? Uh, home modifications, and if it gets to the point where home is not a safe environment, and again, we have had some situations where someone, that's their intention, but the home modifications get to be too great, it gets to be too expensive, or it might end up changing the value of their home in the long run um, for the worse, the decision is made to transition to an assisted living facility or a skilled nursing facility, and long-term care insurance can be a pay source uh, for that level of care as well. Medicaid, we always get a lot of questions about Medicaid as people have spent down their assets. So many people uh, now are frankly running out of money. They're living way longer than they anticipated to and, and the money is just not there to continue to sustain their care needs. Um, you, you know, if you think about your care needs as your money diminishes towards the end of your life, that's the most expensive period of your life in terms of health care cost. Uh, and so it's an unfortunate uh, divergent <laughs> of circumstances and, and, and that, that accelerates. Um, and so a lot of people find themselves in a position where they're depending on these types of programs to help them. Medicaid has some coverage for limited home care. I should have put an asterisk that today Medicaid has coverage. We don't know what it's gonna look like tomorrow or next week. It's an ever-changing program. 
um, and, and it's, it, it's not, a, not a good one to plan on or to depend on. They do provide some coverage for assisted living, skilled nursing care. I always tell people that the trick is to try to find a provider or a facility that's accepting Medicaid. Uh, it's, it's much easier to get on to Medicaid than it is to actually figure out how to use it. Uh, two totally different things. The fourth category, of course, is private funds, and that's what most people depend upon if they are going to put a plan in place to be able to age in place for as long as possible. And again, this goes back to the planning um, and preparing. And the, th the areas that Blake mentioned that are high risk areas, um, I, th this is purely anecdotal, I don't have statistics to back this up, but when we have seen that clients have already taken care of the bathroom and made it very safe way in advance of when they have needed to do so, um, you know, th their ability to remain in, at home much longer is much greater. They also don't have the expense of having to do something in an emergency. Um, so if someone falls and uh, there's an accident, the person is hospitalized and is coming back home, you don't have a lot of turnaround time to plan, to do your homework, to make sure the people that you're working with are the best people that you can be working with for the project. And so um, sometimes you end up with a lot more out-of-pocket costs when you're trying to, to scramble to get things done. So the people that have taken care of this ahead of time are definitely in a much better spot. Uh, private funds are obviously going to be able to enable you to pay for, uh, for care. Uh, when we're setting up a plan for someone to age in place, we're obviously looking to leverage um, the, the sources of care that don't require money. Um, but again, you can't tax that. We can't go to an adult child and say, we think it's a good idea for you to quit your job and, and, and be at mom's house 80 hours a week. That's just not feasible. So we wanted to put something in place that's realistic, um, but we also have to, have to balance that with what the funds look like. And just to give you an idea, paying privately for home care in this market, I would say averaging uh, about $18, $19 an hour um, to pay for care. So it takes uh, no time at all for that to add up quite considerably when you've got someone at home. And the last category is VA benefits. VA benefits are about to undergo some tremendous changes, and you might have heard about it in the news. There's a few different outlets that have picked it up locally. Um, so there are some changes on the horizon, but I will talk just very briefly about VA benefits. VA benefits are available for veterans and surviving spouses, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize, is that if there is a surviving spouse, um, that they may be entitled, if they need care, they may be entitled to a, um, a stipend, a monthly stipend from the government. Um, so the information, I can give you the information, I can point you to different federal websites uh, where you can be connected with that uh, information on the pension. That follows the person. So the good thing about that is that we very often will try to get people set up with a VA benefit while they're at home. Um, it brings in money to offset some of those monthly costs, but then if the person needs to be put into a facility at any point, that benefit is going to follow them to the facility. Um, so it's a great benefit to have. You don't have to constantly uh, redemonstrate that you that you have that need. As long as you've got the medical bills coming in, which again, they're increasing, then you're, uh, you continue to be entitled to the benefit. So those are the different pay sources, uh, and, and it's important to recognize that there are always changes. Um, what Medicare reimburses for, how they reimburse it, um, for things, changes annually, who the providers are, how all of that pans out, changes on an annual basis. Medicaid changes are a little bit more frequent than that um, and are really uh, can be politically driven um, too. So usually, when there's uh, a change in power on the state level, you see some, you see a, a huge number of changes to the Medicaid program. Uh, VA benefits again are getting ready to change. The only one that's really rock solid in there are the private funds. Um, and I can't emphasize enough that if someone's plan is to uh, is to age in place, you really got to look at the numbers. We've got to make sure that that makes sense. And that kind of goes back to the idea of holistic planning. Um, and, and, and there are a growing number of people um, that, that indicate that they want to be at home. Now, and when Blake asked for the, rate, for the show of hands, it looked like maybe some of the people that were already caring for people had an experience where the, how, the home that they are in is where they want to stay, but that might not have been the case for as many of, of you, um, for yourselves personally. But sometimes people will make that transition or downsize or what they call right size and, and get into a place that's better suited for you. Um, there's some evidence that people are starting to make those types of decisions, but that home 
if that is going to be where you want to stay is still is the home that you're working with in terms of putting those modifications in place. Um, so we, when we go into a situation, we are looking to see what the goals are. We're not, we're not going in to say, oh no, this is what you need to, you know, we, we need to move you to assisted living. This makes more sense or this is easier. Uh, we're gonna work within your goal. And if your goal is to age in place, um, as it is for many people, we're gonna try to make that happen. But there are a lot of different um, pieces that we have to take into consideration when we're pulling all of that together. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. I can see, some, I can see lots of wheels. Yes? Sure, that's a good question. I'll work backwards, because that's how I remember things. So, um, Long-term care insurance and private funds are used to pay for our services. Unfortunately, it's not something that's covered by Medicare. Uh, we charge an hourly fee for what it is that we do, and we spend some time talking to people up front to kind of find out what they're wanting um, out, of, out of our assistance to be able to understand what it is that we can do for them. And based on that, I'd be able to kind of tell you what the involvement would look like. Um, so the folks that I met with today, that was a one hour meeting. They just needed me to help them sort through their long-term care insurance policy. And if they ever need me again, they can call me. Um, other folks, we know from the very beginning when we get started that we're gonna be very involved and possibly a critical piece of their plan um, you know, as they're trying to, to stabilize their situation. So I can talk to you a little bit more about that afterwards if you'd like for me to. I've got information about how to contact me on the back table, but if you wanna jot down caremanager.org, Dot org, caremanager.org is our national association's website and that will let you look up a care manager anywhere in the world. So very often we'll have people sometimes in the audience that they may be here but their parents are elsewhere um, and so if you need to find someone like me who can put you in touch with local resources in other areas, caremanager.org um, and it will let you know about the other folks that work that do the same type of work that I do who are in the area as well. No, no. We do some work with folks coming out of the hospital. I, 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 a fair number of people come to us kind of in crisis situations or they find themselves in a hospital situation and they thought they were going back home. Again, this goes back to that attachment of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live at home, I'm always going to be at home, I'm always going to receive care at home. And they get to the hospital and the doctor comes in and says, well, you can't go home. You've got to go to rehab <laughs> um, or you need to go to assisted living for a period of time. So we sometimes get those calls from people that really want to try to figure out how can I get back home from where I'm headed next? Um, because that's where I'd prefer to be. Yeah, good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we do uh, a, a lot of hospital advocacy and people say, well, what do you need to advocate for people in the hospital? So clearly you haven't been in the hospital lately. <laughs> um, the the uh, hospital is, a, is, an, is an interesting beast. Um, yes, yeah, so you have to be in for three midnights, curiously enough, is the rule. Um, and you can't just physically be in the hospital. You actually have to have been admitted. So when I tell people that we do advocacy, when I get a call from the adult child who says mom or dad's in the hospital, make a beeline to the hospital and sit there and chant at the doctor's door, has this person been admitted? Have they been admitted? Have they been admitted? Because the hospitals can hold you under observation status. Uh, I had a client that was held under observation status for four days. And it doesn't mean that you're not fed or that you're not given tissues and expensive Tylenol. You get all of that and you get a room, but, you, but it's important because then when you come out and you go to rehab, your rehab bill is thousands of dollars um, to pay out of pocket for what Medicare was supposed to have been paying because the hospital, for one reason or another, did not admit you. So that is, that is key. It's very important to be aware of that, very important.
for, are you talking about caregivers coming in or are you talking about care managers or what, what category of people are you talking about bringing in? Right. Well, there's kind, of, there's kind of an initial decision that a family has to make, and that's whether or not they're going to hire someone privately or whether or not they're going to hire an agency. Um, there are individuals who, and the best analogy I have with this, they're kind of like, like babysitters, I mean, free agents, um, who, are, who are caregivers who are just their own boss, um, and they can be hired privately. Um, as a care manager, I generally steer families towards hiring an agency for liability reasons. Um, but, but that's an initial decision that you'd have to make. Um, and I think that that's going to get its own, you're going to have kind of different sets of questions um, with that. Home care agencies have to be licensed in the state of North Carolina. Um, and they should have a really good working knowledge of what they can do and what they can't do in the home. Um, so we've been involved in some client situations where they say, well, the home care agency said they're not really supposed to do this, but then they did it anyways. And that's, that's not what you want to hear. Even though that might have been helpful, that's not what you want to hear. So, so depending on which one of those paths you take, um, I, I could kind of talk to you a little bit more about that afterwards, about what kinds of questions you'd want to ask, um, because there really there are no shortage of home care companies. There's over 200, I think, that are licensed in Mecklenburg County alone. So it, it's a saturated, completely saturated market. Um, but and there are some good private private folks um, to be found, and some people have good connections with people that. This person just took care of this person's mom, and she passed away, and so now she's looking for a job. And sometimes those just just kind of happen um, at the right time for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and then that's the other thing. When, when we're looking at the benefits, a lot of families are sometimes surprised to find that they're going to have some out-of-pocket cost before that policy gets up and running. And so, again, that planning, you don't want to wait until the person needs 24 hours of care necessarily. If you can implement the care sooner, it's going to be less out-of-pocket cost to you if you can catch it early enough. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we do. We, we've narrowed down the service providers in, in this county to probably four or five kind of top ones that we've had good experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we're matching people, it's sometimes it's kind of the personality or what the family is wanting. I mean, you kind of have to get a vibe for that. This is a we're, we're in a people driven industry. Um, and, and so you have to be cognizant of, of making good matches, not just with the caregiver that's coming in to provide care for the family member, but also how the family members are going to be able to interact and interface with that company. Um, sometimes that's, that's key in, in, in us kind of figuring out who we're going to recommend as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Jennifer probably has more. Um, I know that there are several like um, contractors that focus specifically on that. Um, the, another way to, there's also a kind of a database similar to what Jennifer was talking about, but for home modifications through the University of Southern California where I got my um, certificate. And if you go to home, H-O-M-E, mods, M-O-D-S, dot org. They have a directory as well, um, and you can get on there and search for, for folks who have been um, approved by the University of Southern California um, Gerontology Center, you know, to do that. Um, another one, um, the National Association of Home Builders, or NAHB, I think it's N-A-H-B dot org. Um, they also have a certification process um, for folks who are certified certified aging in place specialists. Um, that 
the, the initials that you'll see would be caps on the end of a contractor's name or, um, or a health professional. There are several OTs that have that designation. That would be another way to find someone in the area that has that background. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> if you ask me nicely when I'm not on camera. <laughs> I said, if you ask me nicely when I'm not on camera. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and, and I will say, it's, it's kind of the same thing with, with choosing a facility as well. Um, you, you know, people can, I can recommend one facility to 10 families and five of them are gonna go in and tour and not like it and five of them are gonna fall in love with it and move in. Um, and so it's, sometimes you can kind of pick up on those preferences and steer people and, and you know, avoid them uh, kind of on a, on sending them on a wild goose chase. But, but, but you will find that some people have good experiences with with agencies that some people have bad experiences. Um, but yeah, I, I think getting, getting input from people that have had experiences, uh, more than just I'm friends with the owner, I, I think you know, it needs to be a little bit more than that. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess that's why I'd, when I said earlier, just making sure you pull in other people yeah. who have had that experience yeah. to kind of sign off on it, I guess. Yeah. And you also have to think about this, I, I think, too, it's important to realize that this is a spectrum. You, you can be looking at a major renovation to the home all the way down to is the person taking their medication? Is the person mm -hmm. able to open up their pillbox? Um, because that's part of you being able to live at home independently. And there's so many different things that happen during your day that are in between. And so, you know, kind of recognizing that you've got to, you really have to kind of get down in the details and figure out. Um, you know, w what all need, and it's, it's a wide variety of different things that you need to implement um, to address all of the person's needs. It does, it does. And it, it can be it done does. in phases too. Mm -hmm. I um, assessed a home in Asheville and the lady, um, like right now she had a nice railing that could help her get in the back door, but you know, I advised her down the road, you may need a ramp. And so this may, this, it might wanna look like this. So you know, maybe having, you know, plan A, plan B, you know, kind of down the road. So. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's part of what we do for our assessment, is particularly when people are trying to figure out, 
should this person still be living at home? Is it time you know, for us to make a move? Um, trying to kind of figure out what that person's level of care um, is. But I, I think an OT and a PT are definitely qualified um, as well to make that determination. And in fact, the therapists that you see that are in rehab settings are often the ones that say this person should not return mm -hmm. home or this person cannot live by themselves any longer. Um, they're actually the ones, not, not the nursing home itself that's saying that, but the, but the therapy, that's coming from therapy. Um, you know, those recommendations. So it kind of depends on the circumstances mm -hmm. when you would need that assessment as to who would be the most appropriate person to do that. And the, and the setting that they're in as well, if you're in a hospital, the therapist mm -hmm. there, it's a team approach. Right. Usually the OT and the PT work together and the speech therapist at times if there's right. cognitive issues. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? These are good questions. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that's an excellent point. When we're putting together a plan that involves a lot of different moving parts, we are always asking clients if they belong to a faith community, and we're going to that church to see if there's parish nursing, to see if there's, uh, we've got several churches in the area that have friendly visitor programs or transportation services so that, uh, so that people who are homebound can get in for traditional church services. So yeah, tapping, tapping into the church community is, is absolutely huge. And really, I think it, it speaks to Another uh, important takeaway is that you need to let let people know if there is a need in your life. Uh, letting people know and spreading the word. So I think about the DME closet that's that's downstairs. If if you have a need for something, letting other people know that you have that need. I, just the most serendipitous things can happen when you spread the word, uh, you know, about something that's needed. So letting people know, you know, how what they can do to help you and what and what you need. You never know what the person you're telling might might have in mind that they can connect you with. Yep. Great questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They, they don't, but, but the, uh, the aid and attendance benefit, which was the specific benefit that can be used to pay for care, is, is the benefit that people use to offset the cost of home care um, or assisted living cost or nursing home cost. So um, it's not that they staff their own cases with, with aids necessarily, but it, that stipend can go to pay for care. Um, We could look at it, I, I, yeah, and I could definitely get you to somebody that could help you with the application portion of it, but usually going through the circumstances and age and that kind of thing, I could tell you if, if it's a good time to go ahead and apply. <laughs> yes. Perseverance and patience. <laughs> because then once you get through the perseverance, you have to sit and wait <laughs> for the government to get back to you, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of resources within the VA. They don't necessarily make it very easy to find out about it. So, right. Mm -hmm. Right. There's another resource. Unfortunately, not here in Mecklenburg County. But if you have loved ones that live in other counties, you might want to look into the Area Agency on Aging. Some counties have money set aside for home modifications. 
Mecklenburg is not one of them. <laughs> um, but that might be uh, another resource to tap into. And the person coming next week, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a little bit after my um, associate, Ashley, she just raised her hand. She's the counselor that works for our company. Um, she works with the family caregivers. She'll be able to answer questions, and I think Blake can hang out for a little Absolutely. bit. So mm -hmm. we don't want to hold anybody up, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.